haunting tales of dark shivering. <laughs> dark shivering is a quaint village which lies on the English and Welsh border. It is notoriously difficult to find and with neither Wales or England staking their claim over it. It has been largely forgotten and untouched by outside hands. Each building in Dark Shivering seems to have its own tale to tell and with the dark surrounding woodland and long lonely stretches of road it's not hard to see why people become frightened by the local ghost stories. After many years of staying in Dark Shivering whilst on business, I have managed to amass quite a few stories from the dark side. Here are a few to make you shiver. The Ritual Wisteria Lodge started life in the early 1700s. Over the years the house has been slowly added on to with extensions from various eras, so that by the 1990s it became the sprawling lodge that we see today. Generations of the Armstrong family have lived there for over 200 years and in this time they have set out one of the most beautiful and well-established country gardens I have ever seen. The gardens are open to the public for most of the year as each season has its own showcase which is equally amazing in colour and life as the next. Even in the midst of winter the garden is alive with hues and tones. People flock from all over to see these gardens and it is one of my favourite places to visit when I'm in dark shivering. The lodge itself sits behind Devil's Church graveyard and its gardens stretch out in front of it welcoming guests with perfumes and scents floating in the air. To all intents and purposes it looks like the idyllic setting we would all love to live in. That is however until you dig a little deeper. One of the most intriguing family members to live there was Alexander Armstrong. He followed a non-conformist way of life from 1875 until 1947. His life in fact started with an unusual event when his mother, who was a very religious and highly strung woman, seemed to suffer from a delusional period after Alexander was born. She would tell anyone that would listen that he was the devil's child and that he kept giving her the evil eye. This went on and off for the rest of her life until she died from consuming rat poison in 1890. How she came to eat it, or why was never discovered and due to her already fragile state of mind people were quick to assume she had taken her own life. By this time, Alexander was a young man. He spurned most orthodox religion and had chosen to follow an altogether more controversial lifestyle in its day. He ranked highly in the Masons and the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, a magical order concerned with spiritual development, and in turn used these influences to guide his life through a long trail of recreational drug taking, sexual depravity of all kinds, and gaining supernatural knowledge. He flounced from one experience to the next, living off his family and drunk on life. It was early in the 1900s that his thirst for learning pushed him to the edge of each encounter, and compelled him in his magical studies. His family put up with his eccentric ways and left him to his own devices. His father and two sisters still lived with him at Wisteria Lodge, and all were loath to accept his devilish ways. The current Armstrong generation that occupies the lodge has a large collection of diaries written by previous family members. Both Alexander's sisters were keen diarists, and theirs especially are filled with secrets and tales of shocking behavior that they could only share with their diaries at that time. Many entries describe Alexander's attempt at performing dark rituals and grimoires that once performed will open the door for your holy guardian angel to come in and enlighten you with untold knowledge and leave you with the power to direct a legion of demons in your bidding for wealth and power. Diary Extracts from Helen Armstrong The 10th of September 1905. This fool of a man will be the end of our family. Yes he is my brother but in no way are we similar. I pray every day to save his soul from the devil, but I fear it is too late. He has gone further than most men would dare in his quest. His quest which I do not understand. To me his quest for knowledge and power is his attempt at playing God, no less. Both Elizabeth and I live in a state of perpetual fear. The fool has been messing with nature. He sits daily in a darkened room with no food, and only minimal amounts of water. Praying he says, but I know of no prayers spoken in those covert tones. 
the 15th of November 1905. It has been two months since my brother began this obscene work of his. Elizabeth and I were in the garden late afternoon when bold as you like, Alexander came strolling out as if he had never been holed up in a room these previous weeks. Neither of us spoke as his usual dirge filled the air. I smiled to myself secretly. The moronic fool can't even devote himself to his, God, what chance does he have with mine? The 27th of November 1905. These past few nights have been simply intolerable. Elizabeth and I have taken to sharing a bed through sheer terror. We have been hounded by a giant beast that walks the corridors at night. It bangs on the walls, runs up the staircase and howls along the upper floors. Father said he has heard no such thing, but I know he feels the evil all around us. The foolish boy has wandered off for his next adventure and left us to cope at the demon's lair. I have spoken to the minister who will visit us sometime tomorrow. We are to sit and pray whilst in battle with this awful beast. Never have I felt the need for God's grace as strongly as I do now, and I can only hope that he does not forsake me as I have given his enemy a home. The 23rd of December 1907. Whilst taking some quiet time today to consider and read my Bible, a nasty little monster came and tried to distract me from my work. He was a small one this time, less than a foot in height and he began hanging off my book, swinging back and forth trying to steal my concentration away. After ignoring him for a while I decided enough was enough and I flicked him on his head to get rid of him. Poof! Off he went in a cloud of black smoke. Strange how I have become accustomed to dealing with my brother's evil house guests. I continue to pray each day that they will leave me in peace, but for now anyway. I am stronger than them, as I can dance in the light, not just the dark. It would seem from these diary extracts that Alexander never finished the occultic ritual that he'd started, which is said to be a dangerous position to be in. By not finishing what he had started he left the door open for any elemental spirit to visit, not just his holy guardian angel. And by all accounts they did visit over the years. The family still reports strange sightings and occurrences, including incidents of the howling noises from the upper floors late at night, and no one uses Alexander's chambers. A later diary entry by his great, great niece suggests that the rooms were not fit for purpose as the air in them is still rancid. She doesn't make clear if this is an actual smell permeating the air in the rooms, or if it's her general discomfort with its history. I am hoping that one day the diaries of the Armstrong family will be published. They are a fascinating insight to a bygone era that brings Wisteria Lodge and its residents to life. They answer a lot of questions as to why the gardens have been designed in a certain way, and why the house was built and decorated to certain criteria. I have only had a brief glimpse at some of the diaries, as the family allow them to be displayed to the public via the British Heritage Society, who have deemed them of great importance to our cultural understanding. It would be fitting to end this story with a tale of how Alexander Armstrong was also haunting Wisteria Lodge and had been seen on many occasions recreating the rituals in his ghostly form, however this isn't what happened at all. Alexander Armstrong had been living in Wisteria Lodge at the time of his death in 1947, but his ghost has been reported elsewhere. His, is the ghost that causes a nasty stink down at the Masons Lodge in Little Dilly which is the neighboring town to dark shivering. The Masons know when he is in the building as a bad odor fills the air. He is also known to push people and has been seen on many occasions stood in the dark shadows waiting for meetings to begin. Dark Shivering has lots more stories to give up, and I'm always collecting them for future books. Join me next time for more haunting tales of Dark Shivering. Don't forget to click, like, and subscribe so you never miss another ghostly episode.